our presentation is about SARS, which is Severe Acute Respiratory Syndrome. So there are unknown facts about SARS and known facts about SARS. The known facts about SARS are that an outbreak occurred in 2003, happened in China, and it evolved from animal-human interactions with a strange animal called a civet. Now a civet looks like a honey badger mixed with a bobcat mixed with a raccoon. So now we're going to take a little trip to 2003 and see what the SARS outbreak might have looked like. So there's this girl named Rebecca. She's visiting China to see her grandmother. When walking down the street one day, she comes into contact with a civet. What she doesn't realize about the civet is that the civet ate a bat and therefore contained the animal version of SARS. Later, Rebecca finds that she is showing symptoms of fever, dry cough, and dyspnea. With these symptoms still, she returns to her home country of Paris and the SARS outbreak begins. First, we are going to start with the simplest model that we learned in class, the S-I-R model. S standing for susceptible individuals, I standing for infected individuals, and R standing for recovering individuals. We add several populations to our model, starting with E. E stands for asymptomatic individuals. These are people that don't show symptoms of the disease even though they have been exposed to it. Next, we add a parameter, J. J stands for people that have been isolated after they show symptoms of the disease. Isolation is where a person with the disease is separated from healthy individuals of the population, usually in a hospital. Last, we will add the subpopulation of Q. Q stands for quarantine. Asymptomatic individuals are put into quarantine to make sure that healthy individuals that are susceptible do not get sick. The only way you can get out of quarantine is through natural death or moving to isolation. Now we're going to talk about the parameters of the model that was given in its full entirety in the paper. First, we have people entering into the model in purple. Capital Pi is the rate of susceptible individuals entering the model through new birth, immigration and immigration, which happens when one person that is susceptible moves from one susceptible area to another susceptible area. Next in red, we have the death rates. Mu is the natural death rate, and that occurs in every subpopulation. Then we have D1 and D2. D1 is the death rate of the symptomatic individuals. D2 is the death rate of the isolated individuals. Next, we have the people demonstrating symptoms. That's Kappa 1 and Kappa 2. Kappa 1 is people demonstrating symptoms from the asymptomatic group, E, to the symptomatic group, I. Kappa 2 is the rate of demonstrating symptoms while in a control environment, meaning going from quarantine to isolation. We now have the parameters for controlling disease, which include Kappa 1, which is quarantining, from group E, which is asymptomatic, and isolation of the people that are symptomatic. Lastly, we have the recovery rates. You can only recover if you have the disease and show symptoms. So our recovery rates are sigma 1, which is from symptomatic to recovered, and sigma 2, which is from isolated to recovered. So again, okay, here we have two figures listed directly from the paper. These are two of eight. They have two of these graphs for each of the four areas, GTA, Beijing, Singapore, and Hong Kong. Kong, I am not showing the other six for time constraints, but they do exist. The reason Singapore was chosen is it is the easiest graph to draw. So 
On the y-axis of this graph, we have the number of people dead with over time on the x-axis. The number of people dead is, we assume, calculated by taking the initial end, subtracting the final end. The paper's authors do not account for the mu, which is the people dying of non-SARS-related causes, so we didn't eat either when we were interpreting this graph. As you can see, it is much lesser than the number of suspected cases. The number of suspected cases, we believe, was found by taking the initial S susceptible and subtracting the final S susceptible because anyone who enters the model as shown earlier cannot go back to being susceptible. So, as well with the graph, we have black lines which represents the model's predictions and blue, the blue dotted lines represent the WHO's actual um, numbers for the SARS outbreak. As you can see, they claim relatively close together with some variation between it can be explained by stochastic events not able to be interpreted and inputted into the model. All right, so I'm gonna be explaining the DDT equation, e being the this being the change in asymptomatic individuals over time. It's worth noting that each subpopulation has their own version of this equation, but we are only focusing on this one because it has the most parameters and is the most complex and also for time constraints. So if we look at this equation, we have first initially we have P, which is the number of sick people entering independent of any sort of subpopulation we have in our group. This is people emigrating from another area who are already sick and automatically enter E. We then have this whole thing, which is essentially the clause of people going from S to E. This is determined by the infectivity and the number of people in each other category that feed into E. So symptomatic, asymptomatic, quarantined and isolated. This is all controlled by beta, which is the base disease transmission rate. But while beta is the same for each one of these sort of subclauses we have here, epsilon, is it, which is a modifier D based on various things like hygiene within that category, or say isolation within that category, the modifiers for epsilon are different. So for example, one of the assumptions in the paper when they're doing it is that Epsilon Q and Epsilon J are zero, which means these clauses do not exist because they assume that in quarantine and isolation we have perfect uh, hygiene and, per and perfect quarantine and perfect isolation, so there is no beta. If we had an Epsilon of one, we would have poor hygiene, or greater than one would be hygiene so bad that the transmission rate is actually increased. This whole clause is divided by N, which is just our total population of everything in the system. If we go over here, we have the rate at which people leave E, which is determined either by, which is either through the rate of quarantine, EQ, E to Q, the rate of symptom expression, E to I, or just natural yep. non-disease rules. All right, so I have here our some bifurcation diagrams we generated to support the, and analytically support the main ideas of the paper that isolation with pretty much no funds or resources devoted to quarantine is better than mediocre isolation and medium quarantine. So on our bifurcation diagrams, we have the number of SARS deaths compared to a changing of the epsilon Q and epsilon J modifiers for beta transmission. We calculate SARS death by just taking the initial end and subtracting the final end. They do the same calculation in the paper, even though we have this mu constant in our calculations, which is non sars related deaths. They concluded it was inconsequential, so we will do so as well. When we talk about this stuff, let's, oh yeah, let's just explain it right now. So you have epsilon j bearing here, and we've set epsilon q in this equation equal to one. That means our epsilon q is the worst possible it can be pretty much. Much, there is no hygiene procedures. There is nothing going on here. Our quarantine policy is poor, poor. What we see is obviously as epsilon q and epsilon j approach, as epsilon j approaches one, things get worse and worse and worse, but, if we look at a perfect epsilon j value of zero, our isolation policy is perfect, hygiene is fantastic, there is no transmission coming in or out from the from isolated populations. We see a death rate of around 150, 100, which is worse than it actually was. But if we compare it now to our epsilon q bifurcation diagram, where epsilon j in this equation was set to 0.36, which is an actual real world value that they use for this, this, we see that obviously as epsilon q approaches one, we have tens of thousands of people dead. But as we, even if we scale it back down to say point, 
4.36 set epsilon q equal to epsilon j, we're seeing about 5,000, 4,000 people still dead. The scalar on the graph is not fantastic, but we still see that many people dead. So the obvious conclusion you can draw from these two bifurcation diagrams is that 4,000 people is still a lot more dead than 200 to 150 people, and that perfect isolation is a lot more valuable than mediocre isolation and mediocre quarantine. Of course, there are issues with these bifurcation diagrams. They are not the most accurate. They might not be exactly how they were on the paper, but that's also because we were forced to make a number of assumptions with the models due to how the paper is written, but we'll get to that later. So for critiques of the paper, the main critique that I personally have of the paper is that EJ and EQ are not explicitly, or epsilon J and epsilon Q are not explicitly given by the paper. They are referred to vaguely as we did not use them, but we used a stepwise function in other parts, but it is never explicitly stated what values they use for it, which makes replicating the data very difficult, and is why our bifurcation diagrams seem very wonky and awful on the scalars. Also, they made a few assumptions throughout the paper. One that was explicitly slightly annoying was that if you are in the quarantine group, you are guaranteed to get sick, when in real life you could possibly not get sick even if you were quarantined. They also don't include an outflow similar to P in their model. If you remember, P is the inflow of diseased individuals into the E asymptomatic group. They don't have a similar outflow indicating that once people enter this model by sneaking in essentially when they're sick, they also don't leave the model. So that just doesn't make sense biologically. I understand why they did not include it, but it is a critique. And Nikki will have some conclusions. So the conclusions of the paper were basically isolation is better than quarantine. If you have to choose one, it's better to have a really good isolation and an okay quarantine, preferably having both, rather than having a really good quarantine and not a very good isolation. Also, a few other additional conclusions the paper made were travel within and between countries is really bad for the disease in, that, in the fact that it can make it spread worldwide very quickly. And also, these findings that we found in the paper can be applied to our current situation with COVID-19. The conclusions of our model are that having a perfect isolation and a not so great quarantine are better than having a mediocre quarantine and a mediocre isolation. So therefore we should be using our, our resources to have a perfect isolation, even if quarantine is like not so great. Also, traveling within and between countries is a way that can lead to a widespread of a disease worldwide. And lastly, the findings that we found in this paper and the diagrams that we use can be easily transitioned to COVID-19 in our current situation today.